And when I was 16 years old, I was chosen homecoming queen for Roosevelt. It was a real exciting time. We were going to be playing Punahou at the old stadium. Your arch rival. I know, <laughs> our arch rival. <laughs> and my mother was supposed to buy me a dress. I was going to ride around the stadium in the Schumann carriage, and I was going to ride around with a horse. And I was so excited about it. It was on the front page of the news and everything. And so my mother says, well, before we do that, we got to go pick up a necklace I had made. Okay. She said it was the name of her book. And, and it was an obscene name. And we go to Kahala Mall, Liberty House. We go in, she goes into the fine jewelry department. And I hear the lady behind the counter say, sorry, Mrs. Hicks, but management wouldn't let us make your necklace. She was so mad that she goes up the escalator throws off her clothes and goes down the other side of the escalator, totally Naked. in the nude. And she sees a guard down there, and she sees a guard, and she backs up, she sees another guard, and she's going up and down the escalator, really enjoying herself. And she was, she was pretty. She was 39 years old, beautiful shape. And pretty soon, one guard yells to the other, well, how do you grab a naked lady? Sharon Hicks never forgot that day. When she started writing her memoir many years later, she went to a workshop and told another author about the incident. The other writer said, Sharon, there's the title for your book, How Do You Grab a Naked Lady? Sharon Hicks shares the drama of growing up with her mother's mental illness, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. If you grew up in Hawaii, especially during the late 1950s through the 60s when construction was booming, you may remember the many house lots that were fronted by signs saying Hicks Homes. Before Harold Hicks moved his family to Hawaii to start his construction company, he lived in Los Angeles, where his daughter Sharon Hicks was born. During those early years, there already were signs that something was different about Sharon's mother. She'd lock me out of the house, or she'd lock me in closets. It was like out of sight, out of mind. How old were you? I would say four or three, three or four and years And you'd be old. out in the yard? Yeah, just or sit in outside. Or in a closet? Yeah. She locked me in the closet. For how long? I don't even remember that, but I just remember being locked away. Your brother had a different situation at a young age. He was tied to the clothesline? <laughs> yes. Isn't that something? But he liked it. What he didn't like was eating his cereal in the morning, and if he didn't eat that oatmeal, he had it for lunch, and then he had it for dinner. And he said it was awful. He had to finish his oatmeal. After breakfast, he would run outside and stand by the clothesline waiting to be tied up. And she had a harness, and she'd put the hook on the, and he had the length of the clothesline to play. And he said there was a kid on the other side of the fence, and he'd peek through the fence and talk to once in a while. And at, at a certain point, he got banished from the house. Yes, he had to sleep downstairs in the garage. And how old was he then? Ten. And uh, there were rats in the garage? Yes. He told me, he said, Sharon, don't tell Mother there's rats downstairs in my bedroom. Don't tell her. And I said, oh, I won't. And so I'm, what am I, 10, I'm um, six. six. And so I run up, mother, <laughs> David has rats in his room, just always just telling you because he doesn't want to sleep down there. And then uh, I'd go down there with him and we'd sit on the top bunk and he'd have a BB gun and I wanted him to show me the rats. And he did. And he would fire this, this gun at the, at the rats. He's been, uh, they were huge. My brother's thinking was it made him very strong. So he, he found a positive in yes. it. Yes, made him very strong. When you're a child, you don't know what, what childhood and family life is supposed to be. So maybe you would think it's not so odd that my mom sends me outside or locks right. me in a closet. Maybe that's what has to happen. I know it. And I did compare my mother to the ladies next door, the mothers next door. And what really bothered me the most about the ladies next door that that they would buy things at the store that my mother wouldn't buy. Isn't that interesting? I used to think about that because my mother would never buy packaged cereals, packaged cookies, anything in packages. Everything was fresh. Everything was homemade. But when I went to, this was in California when I was real young, I went to the park houses next door. We had packaged cookies and there was cereal you could pull in a bowl and it was just totally different. I thought, oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. But that's the big difference you yeah. saw. <laughs> But, but, yeah. but, but you're, clearly your mother wasn't like other mothers. No. And Saturday nights were great because she, had, she gave parties. And she, she was beautiful. Again, she 
everything was the, the linens, the, the, the silver, the china in those days. And then you made things. You made the rolls, handmade rolls. You made the pies. You made, you know, and then she entertained. I mean, she did it all. She could play the piano and sing. And she so you, it. you enjoyed that? Yes, because she was happy and the house was happy, full of happy people. Sharon Hicks was 10 when her family moved to Hawaii. That's when her father started his construction company, building more than 20,000 homes and becoming one of Hawaii's top builders ever. My dad graduated from high school when he was 15, and he was raised in Los Angeles. At 10 years old, though, he was selling newspapers on the corner, and he was telling the Johns where the girls were. He was always working it. Well, he graduated 15, went to work for a company called May Company. He became a buyer of women's clothes. And then he wanted to open up his own stores, women's stores. So he got a contractor's license. He built them himself right there in Broadway in Los Angeles. Had two stores called Carolyn's Apparel after my mother. And he liked that. But then my uncle called from Hawaii and said, I need you over here as a contractor. And that's when we came in 1950. And the business concept he had was what? What did Hicks Homes do? He wanted people to be able to choose a design for their houses. For instance, if you walked into Sears and wanted that refrigerator, I want that refrigerator in my home. It's the same type of concept. He had about 30 designs, and you chose your design. No changes in those days. So all the roofs were white, so nothing but got, get, got confused. Yeah. <laughs> And the windows, and you know, he had oak floors and redwood walls and everything. It was, it was quality built, but because it was pre-designed, it was affordable. There was a time when, you know, there were Hicks homes everywhere with, I remember all the signs that say, this is a Hicks homes under construction, and yes, white roofs, and I, I, I recall Ina Heine, and right. uh, he, he said he was on all the islands. Mm -hmm. And his company was called Hicks Construction Company, never Hicks Homes. But he was building so many homes, 100 a month, that people said, I live in a Hicks home. That's and true. that's how it started. <laughs> he did that for how many years? He started in 1954, incorporated in 54, and he died in 1967. Not very long, but in 2006, the Building Industry Association inducted him into their Hall of Fame as the most influential contract of the past 50 years. He made it possible was, for regular people to, right. to build their own home without having um, to and, hire and a and lot of people. And other contractors liked his method and they adopted it too. So you're a girl growing up with her brother who's four years older in East Honolulu. Mm -hmm. When they first moved here, mother threw a party and she invited everybody. And she came out of her bedroom three times and three different negligees see-through negligees, you know, one was white, one was black, and one was pink. And she always had a teddy bear, and she'd come out to greet the guests, and they were totally see-through. I'm 10 years old, and I'm going, oh my gosh, what's going on? My dad invites somebody to the party, who's a friend of his at the Lions Club, but he's also a doctor. So he comes, and he's watching my mother, and my mother's snuggling up to him, because he's so handsome. And finally, he comes to me, and he said, Sharon, let's go next door. So we go next door. He says, I'm going to call Connie Uy State Mental Hospital. They're going to come with a, a wagon. You know, um, all the men are going to be in white. They're going to strap your mother down. She's not going to like it. She's going to scream. And we're taking her to Connie Uy Mental Hospital because she's sick. And when I heard the word she's sick, I thought, wow, then she can get better. This is wonderful news. Sharon Hicks loved her mother and longed for more of her mom's attention. But her mother was getting worse, not better. For her mother, that trip to Kaneohe was the first of what would become a lifetime of hospitalizations, medications, and even arrests. She did have shock treatments. Oh, many, many. And she said, in those days, there was no muscle relaxant. So she said it was like laying on a train track and having a train hit you head on. And everything was white. She, she described the room as white, the doctors were in white, the sheets were white, and when that electric hit you, it was just white, you know, and she said it was just, it was awful. Did psychiatric medication work for her? She had schizophrenia mm -hmm. and bipolar, but was it possible to control her illness with medication? They tried, but she, it was awful. She would take ice cubes and rub her arms like this, or she'd pace. 
to vomit. Um, it was harsh medication, yes, especially in the early days. Yes, lithium. They had to work with you to get the quite dosage, and she didn't want to do that because it was awful. And why would you want to take medication anyway when you're having so much fun? When your mother came home from the hospital after shock treatments, what was she like? Like a zombie. She didn't remember where things were in the house. Um, she, I remember having to drive in the car with her, and I'm, I'm young, 10 or 11 years old, telling her what grocery store we go to, what bank we go to, how to shop, come home, help her figure out even how to chop carrots. You were the first homecoming queen at Roosevelt. I know. I mean, and, and most ideal. And most ideal. <laughs> and yet, so, your home life was yes. not to be envied. And you know, you're worried about what other people think, possibly. And I, I can just say that when I was a kid, I lived about a mile and a half down the road from you on the other side of Kalani on Ole Highway. Mm -hmm. And one day, the kids in the neighborhood would say, hey, guess what? Mrs. Hicks is out on the highway naked with a salad bowl on her head. Come on! And everybody <laughs> headed out to the highway to look at your mom with a salad bowl naked. I didn't know you. I didn't know the family at all. But I thought, wow, I wonder if she has kids. I wonder what her family thinks. It didn't connect at all with the, your father, the prominent builder, mm -hmm. the nice house at, on the shore at Niu. Um, and then the beautiful parties your mother could throw, but then this deteriorating personal life with um, outrageous behavior. Mm -hmm. What was it like to be in the house with her? It was like walking on pins and needles because I never knew what she was going to do. I never, know, I never knew when I came home from school what she was going to be like. When I was a junior at Roosevelt, I wanted to throw a party. We had lots of good parties, and in those days, we crashed each other's high school. You know, I was going to have the party, all parties, because my brother was very popular, and I thought I got to have a pop party to be popular. So I went in and said, "Mom, I want a party," and she said, "No, it's too noisy. I don't want kids around. I don't want them in the house using the bathroom. I don't want anybody here." So I said, oh, okay, so I was real upset, and I would go into my bedroom. My father follows me in. He said, Sharon, you have to learn how to ask the question. I said, what do you mean? You have to make it about her. It's not your part, but go back in there and say, Mother, I understand it might be too noisy, and it might upset you, but I really would like to have a party if we followed certain rules, but make it about her. I did that, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and, and wasn't that what your whole childhood was about? Yes. It was about her? It was about her. I had to figure out how I was going to get something, but I had to make it about her first. When you came home from school, did she say, how was your day? No. How did you get your homework done? Oh no. oh, no. Nothing about that. I don't remember her going to PTA meetings or anything or going talking to my teachers or anything. Instead, you kind of got home and you said you could... You could sense when a crazy period was coming on, just like you, you, you can sense rain coming. Yes, and you know what I did, too, is I took piano lessons since I was in sixth grade classical piano. So when I came home, I practiced, and that was my out. You know, I'm sorry, I'm practicing, mother, you know. <laughs> but she had such an ear, a tone for music, that she'd say, Sharon, wrong note. You know, <laughs> she'd be yelling at me. But that was like an out, and I loved playing the piano. It just, and my girlfriend's be waiting out in the yard for me to play, but I was sitting there playing, you know. But th I think that was an escape, a way of just tuning her out. I didn't know what kind of mood she was in. I didn't care. I'm, I'm practicing my piano. And she kind of thought everybody else was a dummy, right, mm -hmm. besides her? Exactly. Very smart. And she was smart. Were you afraid of her? Yes. But, you know, she never really did beat me or anything, but I was afraid of her. More neglect than anything? No, I just didn't know what was going to happen. One of my friends next to our neighbor was saying that they remember uh, her chasing my dad down Kalani Anioli with a broom. <laughs> <laughs> just right down the middle of the highway with this broom after him. And I don't remember, I just remember her sitting at their table and she reached across the table and scratched my dad's face really bad once, just out of nowhere. And you think, where'd that come from? So I just never knew. And be besides being locked in closets and being locked outside and things like that, um, I remember her really uh, hitting me or anything like that, but it was, it was an abuse. But I never thought of it as an abuse, which is interesting. When Sharon Hicks talks about her mother, she recounts bewildering, embarrassing, and sad times. But there's always an undercurrent of love and attachment. 
Still, Sharon Hicks looked forward to taking a break from her mother and her unpredictable home life when she went off to the mainland for college. Her father would eventually leave the marriage. Your father did stick with your mom for a long time. Yes. It just, just throughout hospitalizations and embarrassments and, um, and I, I know people who have mania are often hypersexual. That's a, it's a, one of the, the traits. Exactly. And it might have helped your parents' marriage, you, you mentioned, but also it, it also probably was the last straw for him because it was indiscriminate hypersexuality. Mm -hmm. And that's what ended it for him. When I graduated from college at Long Beach State, he came, they both came to see me graduate. And I knew she was on a manic. I could just see it. You could see it in their eyes. What, is, what does it look like? Her eyes just start to flitter, and you can just tell that she's headed for mania. And my dad found a hospital for her called Westwood Hospital. So I go see my mom, and my mom said, oh, Sharon, you won't believe what happened. I got caught. And I says, what do you mean? I got caught with a night nurse. You knew your mother already had flings? Mm -hmm. And when I saw my dad after that, we were walking away from the hospital, he said, Sharon, I can't do this anymore. I'm just so tired. And he said, I can divorce your mother, but I don't know about your brother and you. How do you divorce a parent? Which I thought was a good question. Thought, yeah, how do we? <laughs> yeah, because what happens to you now, yeah, right? Yeah, and all of a sudden, David and I are her trustees, and we're in charge, and we're, but you know, we step up to the plate, and we say, Dad, you be happy. You've been through a lot. And then you controlled um, a sum of money that, that was used for her support. Mm -hmm. Right, because we knew if she controlled it, it would be gone. Sharon Hicks felt that she needed to find a husband, not only to make her father happy, but to keep from returning to her mother's domain. I married at 19, and I was marrying an idea and not the person because I wanted an escape. I thought if I married this perfect person, we'll have this perfect life, we'll live in California, and that's 2,000 miles away. Uh, he was going to be a dental, he was in dental school, and my dad got so excited that he would sign blank checks and give it to my first husband to fill in the amount. Mm -hmm. Paid for our school, for his dental school, for everything. Because he wanted you to have a perfect life. Yes, this was going to be the perfect squeaky life. But I jumped into it at 19. I didn't know what I, I was. I was a young 19. Mm -hmm. And then that didn't work out because it was an abusive relationship. And I go right on to the next door neighbor where we were living in California. And I just... I think because I was in such a dysfunctional family, I didn't know what normal might look like. I didn't have anything to judge it by, so I didn't really pick a nice, normal person. I had a wonderful role model and a father, but then he stayed. You know, he didn't say that this was wrong or this. He stayed with it. So when I found myself in a, an abusive relationship, I stayed longer than I probably should have. Did you ever talk to, with your father about it? Oh, no, I couldn't. My father died while I was married to the first one, and he never knew I was unhappy. Because you didn't tell him? Absolutely. He paid for everything, you know, beautiful wedding, everything. He bought me a husband, actually bought me a husband. So he, And he thought he was buying you escape. Yes, well, he thought he was buying me security, too. Mm -hmm. This is security. You'll never have to work, Sharon, blah, 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 you know. This is, I'm buying you your security. So I'll take care of you and you'll be yep. okay. Yeah, get your handle with this guy and, you know. But when he was dying on his bed, deathbed, he looked up at me and he said, Sharon, are you having any fun? And that surprised me because I thought, fun? What, what, what is fun? <laughs> you know, I didn't know what he was talking about. And yet you have such an easy laugh. You, you do I find know. humor in things. I do. I so, but you weren't having fun? No, I didn't know what he meant. What do you mean have fun? You know, I thought that was an interesting thing. He'd say, he would say that because I was getting security. You know, it was, where, where did fun fit into all this? Your mom has also passed away. Did she ever say anything like that that made you think uh, as she neared her own end? Oh, all the time. I remember once sitting with her and she said, Sharon, name me one happy couple. Just one. And I had a hard time thinking about <laughs> You know, names, oh, no, no, they're not happy. You know, go. Or she would say things like, there's no such thing as a victim. 
you volunteer to be a victim. Victim equals volunteer. Just remember that. Another one I loved was need is not love. Because you need somebody doesn't mean you love them. If you love them, you don't need them. She'd throw things out like that all the time, and I'd sit there and, th and I'd be thinking about it. Then I'd go home and I'd come back and talk to her philosophically about them. The victim equals volunteer was one that I couldn't get a handle on. Because I said, Mother, what about babies that have cancer? What about people that really are a victim to something? Then she'd have an answer. She'd always have an answer, which is, no, you volunteer for this. And I thought, is she volunteering to be mentally ill? Is she volunteering to get electrodes strapped to her skull and get an electric, you know, shot through her body? But, is she volunteering she, ne she for this? She never had any moments where she talked about her situation and, you know, the trouble she had caused or, or, or the pain she'd felt. Oh, yes, and she would cry. But she was always, then she was the victim. You know, nobody understood her, and she'd cry and she'd share, and it was awful. Oh, we got treated. Mental, it's just awful. Most people don't have the resources your family did at that time. Was, was there something to find that could help? That's difficult. It, and in those times, there weren't that many as there are today. I don't remember even national organizations or, ther or therapy groups or anything. And in those days, in the 1950s and 60s, it was tough if you were labeled mentally ill. And it wasn't until 1983 was there a committee formed called Truth in Psychiatry where a patient had to consent to a shock treatment. Before that, patients never consented. And it didn't happen in all states. I remember in 1980, she was saying, Sharon, there's this new committee formed and they want it, uh, that a patient has to consent to a shock treatment. They want me to testify, but I can't get it together. I don't, I don't want to testify, I should say, but I, I, I want it, but I can't get my act together. But that committee was formed so people did have civil rights who can say, no, I don't, I choose not to have shock treatments. But before then, you had shock treatments. Sharon Hicks moved back to Hawaii with her four children after her second divorce. She became the executive director of several nonprofit organizations before taking over the Hicks Construction Company. After she retired, she was able to finish her memoir, How Do You Grab a Naked Lady? You probably couldn't have written this book when you were younger. You need a lot of insights to process all of this stuff. I was always going to write it, and I thought I could do it when I was younger. I kept notes, and when incidents had happened, I'd write it down, and I had a great big box of all these notes, and I had no idea how it was going to fall together. Because it's a memoir, you, you know, you, you told about how she affected your life. I was always going to do her story, you know, because I always thought she had a wasted life. My dad was very well respected. He was loyal. He was a pillar of the community. He belonged to different clubs. He was always out there doing things, but I don't ever remember my mother doing anything for the community. So I thought, I'm going to write this story because it will help others, and it is. You know, my mother lived out loud, and in writing this book in the same out loud voice, it's becoming a benchmark for other people. You know, they're starting to share their stories with me, and it's opening up doors to talk about stigma of mental illness. You're Just, a grandmother, a great-grandmother. Yes, yes. And uh, this book is going to make some of the younger kids' eyes open wide. Why do you want it out there? I wanted to honor my mother in a way. It shows how she was treated in the 1940s, the 50s, 60s, all the way up to the year 2000. It shows a history of how mental illness has progressed and the pendulum has swung from she had no civil rights, just hospitalized and given shock treatments without a consent to over here where it's just the opposite. Did but she ever really get, I mean, do you think she could have been helped? Because she didn't seem to really, nobody really could she didn't want to grab a naked lady all yeah. through the book. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want help. And so if you don't want help, then it's yeah. hard to help somebody who doesn't want no, it. No, she didn't, because she didn't think anything was wrong. Did anyone really grab or get a hold of the naked lady? Whenever they put a sheet on her, her blanket, she'd throw it off again. She just felt like she had nothing to hide. <laughs> and you can laugh about it. Could yeah. you always laugh about it? Uh, no. No, but I have to because the stories are funny. And you, and you can't write 
a book and have it be a downer all the time. You know, it's 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 life. Because you did let it all go out. You didn't you didn't uh, censor things that happened. You just said, here's how it was. And I was perfect before I wrote the book. I was really perfect. And I'm gonna I'm the perfect daughter. Blah blah. blah. And I'm finding I am more like her <laughs> than I thought. <laughs> and I wasn't perfect. And it was really an eye opener for me. Sharon Hicks' memoir was published in 2012, and her journey continues as she learns more about herself while talking with her book readers who have lived with severe mental illness in the family. Mahalo to Sharon Hicks of East Honolulu, loving daughter whose mother's mental illness destabilized her own life and that of her prominent family, despite the privileges of money. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. What, if anything, do you miss about your childhood? I miss the 1950s. You know, the music, <laughs> the jitterbug. The, uh, uh, of course, we had uh, Elvis Presley and Nat King Cole. I just loved the, the 50s, the times. And, and in those days, there was only 500,000 population in ho total of Hawaii. So where we lived was country. It was a great place.